Hi, it's Dave. Thanks for tuning in to On the Ledge, the Ontario Politics Podcast. Just before we get to today's episode, if you enjoy On the Ledge, it's likely you'll enjoy our daily offering. It's called Now and Next. And I co-host it with my daughter, Erin Trafford. She's the CEO at Story Studio Network. And we always bring in our producer, Becky Coles, to talk about the stories of the day. And we highlight the daily brief sort of a long look at some of the bigger stories of the day. What's going on in Ukraine? How did CTV's firing of Lisa Laflamme affect their brand and corporate culture in general? So these are some of the things that we're talking about. And you can listen to the entire Daily Brief on our Supercast feed. It's nowandnext.supercast.com. You can subscribe to the feed for 10 bucks a month, and it means two things. First, you get the full daily brief on a daily basis. You can hear now and next earlier than our regular post, which happens at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we are also setting up some Ask Me Anything sessions. So if you want to know more about how it is we produce the shows or what we're looking at in terms of some of the politics or ideas or Whatever it is that's on your mind, because it's an Ask Me Anything session, go to nowandnext.supercast.com and support the show. Now enjoy On The Ledge. An original. From Story Studio Network. Uh, Once around the park, James, and don't spare the horses. Well, here we are. It's Friday, September the 23rd. Welcome in this first full weekend of autumn. And it's starting to look like uh, fall, actually. And it all happened really quickly in our part of the world. Last weekend, maybe a hint of color, but um, we live near the Don Valley in uh, Toronto. And I got to tell you, uh, it's really starting to... Uh, to color up. So if, uh, and it looks like a kind of a nice weekend here in town. I know folks who are up in the Algonquin area are uh, starting to report the, the real peak of the colors. There's actually a, a webcam. You can sit, I don't know why you would want to do this, but you can sit and watch the color change in downtown Toronto up in, up in Algonquin. I'll guess maybe you're planning your, you know, just in time trip. So Anyway, here we go. The first weekend of autumn, and it is on the ledge, the Ontario Politics Podcast for Story Studio Network. I'm Dave Trafford. Keith Leslie is here from CHTV. John Wright from Maru Public Opinion. And uh, before we kind of get into the uh, what's going on at the park, I mean, they're not sitting, but there's lots of news to talk about. Um, I gather you guys are battening down the hatches and battening down the battens, as Bugs Bunny would say, uh, Keith, uh, Fiona's coming to visit. Absolutely. She is on her way. Uh, landfall is actually predicted to be uh, about 50 kilometers from where I'm sitting right now. So uh, yesterday, which was a really nice day here, actually, uh, that crisp bit of fall in the air, but nice, sunny. Uh, I put away all the outdoor furniture, put the barbecue uh, into the garage because I may be cooking on that. The biggest concern for most Nova Scotians as this comes in, of course, the winds and that is, is power loss. Uh, you know, we may sustain wind damage. We hope not. There, you know, those surge per, uh, uh, is an issue in, in coastal areas. Uh, those that live really close to the water. Uh, but of course, for most, it's going to be the likelihood of power loss, especially with these massive winds coming in. They're going to be the equivalent to a category two hurricane, even though it's going to be a post tropical depression. But the trees are in full bloom. Uh, mm. so the chances of power lines coming down, uh, you know, as trees get ripped apart, uh, is huge. So we're, uh, we're definitely expecting everyone's preparing for losing power. Uh, Dave, uh, Aaron Trafford had a great tweet yesterday. Uh, if you're looking for someone in Nova Scotia, they're at the grocery store. They were. <laughs> Supplies were just being, everyone was preparing. We have an East Coast tradition, of course, uh, something called storm chips. So yep. you load up on chips as well, well as all your other snacks. But uh, again, things that can be uh, cooked on the barbecue or on, you know, uh, propane fired grills, uh, this sort of thing, because we're all expecting in, in a likely left to lose power. Uh, people were told, you know, stock up for s- at least 72 hours without power. Uh, the university is going to close in completely into lockdown tomorrow night at six. No buildings opening up again until noon. Uh, excuse me, tonight at six, not tomorrow night, Friday night at six, not opening up again until Sunday noon. And even then they're saying to people, and when it looks nice, please stay home. Let the mm-hmm. crews get out and assess the situation. Don't go out right away and rush around. Uh, parts of our town are, I'm in a high area, so the winds are an issue, but flooding is not a concern for me. But parts of Antigonish downtown area have flooded before. 
Uh, they flooded and then froze with water levels halfway up cars before. So this town is used to flooding and it could indeed happen. Uh, but as I say, the power loss tends to be the biggest concern. People have stocked up. Batteries are you know, hard to get, some the C-cells we couldn't find. Uh, but people have stocked up taking this very, very seriously. Um, you know, the, the, the tail end of hurricanes often hit the East Coast. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in New Brunswick, we, we were used to this. They mainly, mainly, there was a lot of rain and some wind. This one looks way more serious. So people are taking it. So Yeah, we were talking to Erin yesterday about it, and she was saying that uh, the downgrading the storm to a tropical storm or tropical depression sounds safer, but the problem is it's less organized, this storm. So it create it slows down more rain. I think they're talking about 100 millimeters of rain in some parts of near Anaganish, the Anaganish is supposed to get yeah. 176. We're, wow. we're in the max range. This town was hit for 100, supposed to be get 176. That's a massive amount of rain. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's scary what's coming. Uh, and it's coming in strong. And as yeah. you say, post-tropical, it makes it sound, oh, well, that's you know less than a hurricane. No, it's still Category 2 hurricane wind strength, but it's now a bigger storm and less of a shape to it. So it's all over the place. So yeah, just the post-tropical depression sounds nicer. It's just as dangerous. Yeah, well, the, the well, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law are in Charlottetown. And so the the as I'm speaking, they're on the text messages back and forth on how to prepare for the storm. And, you know, my son-in-law, Dan, and brother-in-law, Tim, are comparing notes on how you cover up and protect your heat pumps. And... Um, Take photos and of the uh, the property before the storm hits, because when the insurance guys come, the adjusters come. You'll want to see the before and afters. Um, sleep on the ground floor of the basement. Don't be sleeping on the top floor of your house, just in case. Uh, so there are all these kinds of you know things we here in on Upper Canada would never think of in terms of prepping for the storm. But I thought the most interesting thing was uh, Aaron was telling me that the people in their neighborhood started a Facebook group so that they could communicate with one another, assuming they've got, got the power of the cell service. Because they're, this is, they're in a military town. The, the Eastern Passage, a lot of the folks from Shearwater come and go, and they land in their neighborhood. So there's a lot of folks from Ontario who have never experienced mm-hmm. this kind of storm, never mind the prep. And, you know, needless to say, it can be more than scary uh, the first time you go through this. So they're really checking up on each other. They're making sure they're okay. We had a laugh at her, her comments yesterday, though, about the uh, the storm chips. She says, that's such a great marketing shtick because you eat all the <laughs> chips, then you drink all the water, right? So you got to have more water and more chips than you actually think. But I love that the idea that... That those that you know, maritimers and those in, who live you know in the path of the storm, that we've culturally turned this into something. You know, calm down, eat your chips. Yeah. It's there's the, there's some undertone here of don't you know, the hair's not on fire. No, exactly. It's a, it's we live with it. Yeah, but there's another thing that's interesting here because we have um, we have a son who's in downtown Halifax, and this is up until a few weeks ago that that university campus would not have had kids in it. And over the last two years, you just wouldn't have had anywhere close to what we have now. So we've got, <clears throat> in many cases, uh, you know, a full campus. We have kids who are living in homes. Josh is in with uh, four other guys and they're, you know, dealing with a house now and they're up fairly high, but there's trees in the area. They're not down by the basin. But it's been very interesting um, finding out information about what's going to happen, not only through them and prompting them and going through the checklist. And they were out, yes, getting the bottled water and doing everything that they could. Makes them grow up pretty quickly, too, when there's a serious uh, potential threat. And, and But you're also dealing with teenagers who sort of say, you know, oh, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. And it's kind of like... No, go and get the water and get the battery. So, all that, you know, they've risen to the occasion. So l- let me predict that the first phone call is, holy shit, Dad, you have no <laughs> idea how wild it was. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and you know, where, and it's either, Dave, that's the other thing of uh, this is that, uh, first of all, where do you get information from? They don't have yeah, kind yeah. of a new talk 1010 radio station down there. Or, uh, I mean, there is city and stuff, but it tends to be Twitter right now where everybody kind of types in Halifax Fiona and you see what comes up. Secondly, uh, we're taking it in stride, but believing that we're not going to have cell power. Like we just will not, like if you can imagine those, your kid is now going to be out of communication for maybe four days, potentially, maybe more, who knows. And so, uh, I mean, the last flights out of Halifax were yesterday. They have three that are scheduled for today, but I don't think they're going to get anywhere close to where they are. 
But, you know, you've, you've now got a whole, but you've got thousands of parents who are not in Halifax, who are away from there, trying to kind of, you know, keep their shit together as they listen to what's coming and hoping that their kids are going to be away. It's a very different kind of experience where you're trying to say, I have every confidence in the world uh, in you that you're going to rise to the occasion and that your housemates and you're going to do all this sort of stuff. You're going to know it. But on the other hand, you know, you're, you're in a remote control situation, believing that you may not hear from them until maybe next Monday, next, next Tuesday, whatever, maybe even later than that. So th- that's the real concern now that you've got, you know, thousands of young people in a place where they wouldn't have been a year ago because of COVID. So we'll see mm-hmm. how that all works out, but you got to put faith in them that they'll do the right thing. Well, you got to think though, that Dalhousie, this is, this is not, you know, it's not their first rodeo as far as this is concerned. I mean, you know, this is hurricane season, so this would have been something new, but for, for sure for that, this cohort, I mean, three or four years that, you know, you might not have had that, that kind of uh, pressure. So and I'm, John Moore is in my uh, inbox wondering whether it would be okay to talk to, I can connect her with Aaron for uh, an interview on Monday. And again, my answer will be yes. Yeah, so long as she's got power and cell service, I'm happy uh, to connect you guys, but Tell him a you know, former regular. Tell him a former regular on his show is available closer to the action. There you go, and more likely to have power. <laughs> 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 All right, here we go. Uh, polls out today. Take it for what it's worth. I heard a lot of hand wringing, John, about Doug uh, Ford's approval rating only being forty one percent, and I thought, okay, and it was down four percent from the last time it was noted. I guess from July to August. Um, I guess there could be a lot of reasons why you could find, you know, that kind of a drop, but your voice is in the back of my head reminding me, well, you only need, you know, 37% for a majority government in Ontario. So there is a methodological difference between most, uh, between Angus Reid and what I would have put out in a couple of others. So let's, it's very, very simple when you add, and it's, it, it marks the methodological approach by both firms that have gone on for decades. Uh, the Angus Reid poll is usually about five points lower than my poll would be. And that's for one simple reason. And that is when you ask people whether they approve or disapprove somewhat or vary um, of, of the premier, I simply put it out that way. So mine will be mine would have been about 45, 46 today instead of the 41. What they do as well uh, is that they would have neither or don't know. And there's a p- group of people who will go to the, no- the don't know. So what they do is they extract the don't know and they rebase the tables, which means that you're taking a percentage of the population out of what you do <clears throat> and you are lowering the total amount of the percentage. So if you look historically against the Angus Reid and some of the other ones out there, they, it's consistent. It is. Like you can look over the last number of years. So we'd come out and it would be 45 and they'd come out and it would be 40. Or we'd come out and it would be 39 and they'd come out and it would be 34 or 35. The reality is we're in an off season. The reality is that even with the Angus Reid numbers, 41, as I think it was uh, out there, is way more than enough you need for a, a ma- you know big majority. It's more than he had for the first uh, time out there. So the premier's in pretty good shape. There really is no opposition to him, and his performance right now hasn't been judged anything other than being pretty much what it was at the time of the election campaign and thereafter. So I think they're pretty well static. If we'd been doing a poll, they would have been you know forty five. So nothing to worry about at all. Well, uh, Keith, I thought it was a little breathless for the CTV reporter to say he was at seventy percent approval rating at the beginning of the pandemic yeah. everybody was <laughs> yeah. I mean, come come on. On. everybody that, was that was a different era my friend uh i, I think i actually i'm kind of surprised that he only slipped four points uh to 41 percent given what they did after winning the election mm-hmm. brought the house back really quickly rammed through basically with no hearings, no consultation, no anything, this bill that's going to move long-term care patients or people that are in hospitals, alternative level of care, into long-term care homes, maybe not of their choosing, or forcing them to pay $400 a day. Other, more uh, privatization for the healthcare services coming along, uh, and yet they only fell four points. There's some serious opposition to what they've done. There's some serious concerns about the way they're going about doing it. Uh, just literally pushing it through, cutting off debate, no committee hearings, no public hearings. It, it just seems needless, but uh, they, they're getting the job done that they see done. Now they're letting their people go back and regroup till after the municipal election. And uh, this has worked out extremely well for them. Fall, falling four points after you've just been elected and done a couple of heavy-handed things like this and you're in negotiations, 
you know, nurses and education workers and teachers, and they're all still hammering about this 1%, uh, the bill capping all their wages at 1%. I think people, you know, uh, teachers may have lost some of the public support, but I think nurses still have a heck of a lot of public support and holding them to 1% is just, you know, the wrong way for this government to go about things. But as I said, falling only four points, that's not bad given what they've gone through. Uh, they're getting the tough work out of the way right away. Well, I, I expect you'll be in the field, John, right after the day after the first person is pushed out of a hospital into a long-term care facility to see how that approval rating looks. Look, I want to go back to uh, a couple of things that were just said. Number one is that we do ha- don't have an effective opposition. So mm-hmm. we didn't really have one much before because the Liberals weren't up to the plate to hit any balls out of the park, and they still are out of action right now. In fact, even worse so because they don't have a leader whatsoever. Number two is that the NDP are now gathering, you know, the clan and putting everybody together. And I mean that in the Scottish way and um, putting everybody together. And they've got one candidate who's announced that she from Davenport, Toronto is, uh, you know, in the fray. But but we have the opposition parties haven't had anything uh, of energy or momentum to do anything for the government. And the House is not in session, so no one really cares at the moment. So there's there isn't that. The other thing that I would take, though, is that. Yes, the the issue of the long-term care versus hospital stays is a serious issue that's only going to grow. There's a report out this morning, of course, that shows that during the pandemic, there were people who were between, you know, 64 and 70 who were retiring and, you know, early retirement for those who were 63 or so. But we're now getting those who are 55 to 65 who are starting to move into that range as well. And so we start to think of the demographic bulge that's now coming upon us, and we're going to have more and more of that. But I am instructed by one thing, and that was during the pandemic, the moves that the, that the provincial government made that were around, you know, the iron ring around the protection of the seniors in downtown, you know, across the province. The negative numbers came from the most concentrated uh, areas of the population in um, southern Ontario. So Toronto and the GTA, which had the greatest media sources and had the greatest number of concerns and things like that, there was a concentration where the numbers were significantly lower than they were in other parts of the province. And we have to remember that the GTA, and I'm just speaking politically, the GTA is not a breadbasket necessarily for this government. It's in other places of the province. So I'm some of the acute concern and focus, which is, I think, justified, at people being moved from beds, you know, to long-term care many kilometers away and into homes away from loved ones, are it, it, the issues are more concentrated in, let's say, a downtown Toronto. You hear more about it, you know more about it. But in the other areas of the province, when these issues were being affected, it did not necessarily affect the political numbers. So it's interesting to see that there really is a divide between the urban and, I won't say rural, but the, you know, the southern part of the province and the other parts of the province in this. And so I, I think we've heard just a little bit about that concern, but we haven't seen the actual implementation of it. We haven't heard necessarily the screams and yells from loved ones and others. That may come, but it's, it's kind of a blip at the moment. We're not hearing anything yet, but it is it is something that they should be watching when they get back after the municipal. Yeah, and I think that has a lot to do with attention span generally of people who are getting their kids back to school. They're trying to find a freaking bus driver to get the kids to and from still across the province. I'm not quite sure why that has taken this long to bubble to the surface. Um, I know teachers right now who for weeks been hanging around for hours waiting for kids to be picked up after school because the buses don't show up. So, you know, I think that's really distracted a lot of people from what you're talking about, John. Well, but it's also a case of, there's a new dynamic and I do a lot of different research. One of them is about, you know, even store shop. And what we see is the demographic that's out shopping in stores or the younger demographics, but not the older ones. The older mm-hmm. ones, you know, would prefer to go to the stores, but in fact, they are the highest rate that are not going back to stores. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the hangover of the pandemic. For a lot of older people, it's, they're still vulnerable and, you know, they've, yeah. you know, they've learned to live within their boundaries. So you think about this, that those bus drivers, uh, if you're going to be recruiting you know, out there, the retired people, you know, that's not a bad job, you know, get on the bus in the morning and drive it, you know, somebody's got to make that extra income, they tend to be retired people now. And you're not being able to draw them into a bus full of, you know, a gaggle of students, 30% of them carrying COVID home at the end of the day. So there's other dynamics playing out here. But you're right, it's, 
what I've been struck by is the fact that it's been relatively calm. I mean, mm -hmm. we have kids at school. We have those advertisements that are playing out from the government that talks about we're all about sports and play yards and getting kids back to school and things. The unions have been relatively quiet. The only thing has been occasionally the bus thing has popped up. But I've had lots of friends who have said, you know, it's nice to have the kids back at school. They're doing things. And while there might be some COVID around and things, you know, it seems calm for the first time in a long time. So whatever Stephen Lachey and the unions have decided to do going back to school I think has made the anxiety level and the planning ability of parents to go both down and up at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a funny thing. I, I saw a blaring headline from the Atlantic yesterday afternoon, and it uh, was talking about COVID in terms of where we are with COVID and particularly in the United States. And they were citing that there was something like 400 COVID deaths a day in the United States. And that makes it far worse than any flu season we have ever seen historically over the last number of years. And, I, and they framed it as if it was a negative. And I thought, Keith, you know, no, this is kind of a sign that we're back to, we're, we're getting to a point now where Joe Biden can say the pandemic is over. I'm not quite sure who was talking in his ear on that one. But the idea that, okay, this is part of the new reality. And part of it, to John's point, is people are taking this into account. I'm not going to be a bus driver anymore, or I'm not going to go to the mall. Mm -hmm. So we've got to kind of shift our focus in terms of how we offer services, how what we expect of the drivers, what we expect of our teachers, our nurses, and so on. So this public service part of it, I think that we, we need to recalibrate not just the pay, but expectation around that. And I wonder how much of that is going on in the conversation vis-a-vis -vis the negotiation. Probably a good deal. I mean, everything really has to change. And are there ways to better protect everyone? Well, I don't know if we can maintain the level of service or expect the levels of service we had before in some areas. The, the, the interface direct direct is, perhaps isn't necessary. I don't know. Uh, I'm concerned still about the pandemic to some degree. I, when I flew last weekend, I was glad to be wearing the mask on the plane and in the airport with that many people around. Um, in Nova Scotia, uh, there's been, uh, I think a total of about 587 deaths from COVID overall, but 400 and change of those have been since last December. Mm -hmm. Um, so why that, like that, that's a concern still, but in the communities where I, you know, when I'm out and about people are absolutely, uh, way more relaxed, very, very few masks. Uh, and that masks only generally at a, at a large event, like an exhibition or, you know, an auditorium or going to see someone play musically, uh, not so much just going about running into stores. You still see some staff in the stores wearing them, uh, but not so much the customers anymore. So I think it's, it's the new reality, but how they go about dealing with this at negotiations, other than straight up, give me the money, pay me mm -hmm. a decent yeah. wage yeah. so yeah. That, yeah. that that stress is off my mind. The stress of, you know, heat or eat or, you know, paying the bills, all that, that sort of stuff. We know a lot of lower paid minimum wage workers especially are struggling with that well give them more money and take the stress away i mean we know the profits are there uh the, the fact we had the head of sobeys come out this week all indignant because he's just you know people are equating their record profits with them somehow gouging during the pay that's just not it's just the way the market works and and you know i, I won't be uh, ashamed of making a good profit well share some of the damn money then we're not, you know, if you've got that much coming in, you're making record amounts, you took away the bonus pay. How dare you come out and say, well, we're just making simple equated headlines. Yes, we are. That's the way the world works. Around the world, Lisa LaFlamme was fired because she has gray hair. There's no nuance to that story. There's no nuance to this. You made record profits during the pandemic. Share the damn money. What's also interesting, Keith and Dave, is in, we've, in our lifetimes, <clears throat> I mean, combined, we've got over 100 years of listening to politics. Um, but the campaign that the union is putting out about the support workers in, you know, earning only $39,000. I mean, they've tagged, it's, it's like, we only earn $39,000. Mm -hmm. It's the first time I've heard a campaign ever that I can recall where they've, you know, pinned the tail on the donkey of a particular number, which is a gamble, of course, because people hear 39,000, they kind of go, okay, well, you know what, there's lots of people who earn less than that. So you know, they shrug their shoulders and move on as opposed to, you know, our people spend, you know, 48 hours extra a week looking after your child. We have shortages like it's as opposed to the issues around that affect parents and those people who might be involved in the system. It's more around 
uh, themselves and their pocketbook. And I, I, I want, you know, the 39 sticks in my brain, but it's not necessarily a call to action. So I, I was just struck by that. It's just a very interesting tactic. And yeah, maybe they are paid less, but I, it's not something which I think I've heard anybody talk about anywhere within at least, you know, a number of different circles. It's just an interesting tactic. I'm not sure it's going to work, but it's the first time I've heard that. Have you guys, yeah, guys ever heard I sure flagged it when I heard it too, and I thought, "Holy crap! Really? Only?" And I, yeah. I said it before the the voiceover said it's only thirty nine thousand dollars. I thought, "Holy shit!" I mean, it's you know, relatable. I thirty. I was making thirty nine thousand dollars, you know, thirty years ago. Yeah. Right? I'm thinking, oh man. And yeah, raising a family on that kind of and this is what people do. It's these are not starter jobs. No. You know, no, 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 this no. is the whole point. These are people trying to raise a family, maybe send a kid to school. Come on. Uh, it's, it, it, you know, it's just super unrealistic. And, you know, they have a union. Imagine the people without the union. Well, but that's my point. Um, I, and I don't take away from the fact that that's, it, you know, can you imagine living in downtown Toronto or in the environment? Well, you're not. The dogs, they can't. I mean, you're just not. <laughs> you're not I mean, you're not. So I, I, I understand all of that. It's just very interesting that for the first time, they've decided to put up a number. I, I, I can't recall that that's been the campaign and the slogan. So I don't know what research they did to show that that had traction, but it might be simply asking that question. Do you think that people can survive on this sort of funny blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, and going along? But it again, though, it, 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 it's counterintuitive to a political campaign that usually is about the people you affect. As opposed yeah, to yeah, being yeah. affected yourself, maybe they're following on the maybe they're following on the uh, Ontario Disability Support Payment activists, people who are trying, you know, saying, "Hey, you know, eleven hundred sixty nine dollars a month is unlivable." Oh, hey, now it's twelve and twelve and a quarter; it's still unlivable. And people now you start going, "What?" So maybe they've they've just taken because that's one that we all okay. Come on, there's no question here. We are expecting people with disabilities to live way below the poverty line, and not just in Toronto, anywhere. So, so I, I had a real eye opener on this, and and uh, I I, I want to get to a couple things on the municipal election and your 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 note about on Ontario Hydro, Keith. But I did some work with the folks at the Ontario Real Estate Association in the last couple of days. So we had a couple of sessions on presentation. We did a little bit on media training and so on. And we had dinner together on um, Wednesday night. So we're all sitting down having a chat, and we're just you know blah, 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 blah. And of course, you've, inevitably, it, I know what they do because they're all real estate agents and presidents of the real estate boards. So finally, somebody says, so what is it you do? Do you do this a lot? And so <clears throat> I explained what I do with Aaron and Story Studio Network. And, you know, the inevitable question is, well, how do you get paid to produce podcasts? And I said, primarily, it's branded content. And a lot of our stuff is mission-driven storytelling. So it kind of falls in my wheelhouse in terms of my interest as a journalist and Aaron's interest as a journalist. And I said, one of the ones that we do and we we get a lot of uh, feedback on and resonates with the audience is the 2030 Project. And we do that for the Daily Bread Food Bank. And they're all, these are all people who are plugged into their communities. That's the, the, right, the, the heads of the real estate board. So they understand what the housing markets are like and everything else. And when I talk, told the f five people at the table that poverty costs Ontario $33 billion a year, they all stopped. They put their fork down and looked at me. They had no idea. They ha and then we got into the ODSP. And one woman, her sister, lives on ODSP. And she understood it. And they're all, again, these are people who kind of pay attention. They're in the halls of City Hall and, and Queen's Park. They're talking to politicians all the time. And I don't blame them for not knowing this, but I'm, I begin to wonder, to your point, Keith and John, maybe we need to be saying this a lot louder and from the mountaintops. We need a champion at some point to be you know, pointing out, politics aside, that people are living in legislated poverty. And it, it again, it astounded them. And the, the, the funny thing is, Tim Hudak walked in the room uh, just as we were talking about this. And he says, so how's it going? I said, well, we're solving po poverty, Tim. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> but it, I, I just was astounded that it's, it's that so far below the radar. So saying it out loud is one thing, but who the hell's listening? Well, the, the fact that there has now been people, we've been a couple of stories, selecting medical assistance in death rather than trying to survive on disability support payments. 
that's not making this story front page, mainstream, headline, whatever you want to call it. I don't know what will. The, yeah. the, the figures themselves are scary enough, but people are, are actually making that choice, we're told. Holy cow. I mean, that that's, again, just, just share the money to at least, we know it's well below poverty level. At least bring them up to poverty level. Mm-hmm. Oh, then, yeah. then, well, then feel good that, about yourselves. I don't know. I'm just saying that, that'll be the political out. Well, they're out yeah. of poverty by this much. So yeah. there's there's the, there's the challenge, and I, I think we need to have a really mature conversation about it. And I hope that uh, if you get a chance, I would strongly urge you subscribe to the 2030 project. The folks at Daily Bread are doing extraordinary work. I know John has contributed some of the thought leadership to our discussions around this on a couple of occasions, particularly around guaranteed incomes and you know, this whole idea of an aging population and how we're going to deal with it vis-a-vis poverty. But Neil Hetherington, and I know we're off on a tangent, but I think it's important to say, Neil Hetherington is the CEO at Daily Bread. And he said the first, the most, I learned a lot from season one, but the most compelling thing that hit him was he was talking to a high school class. And when, before he went to the class, the teacher told Neil that the podcast was required listening for the curriculum in their school. So they understood what does it mean to live in poverty? And these kids are privileged. What does it mean to have to collect welfare? What is the welfare wall? Uh, You know, how can you actually raise yourself up out of poverty? Is that a possibility? Anyway, he spoke to a class of kids, 15 year olds, I think, and they were all just highly engaged and activated on this. And so Neil's call to action on this particular season is to listen to it, but listen to it with your students. Listen to it with your kids. Listen to it with, you know, family, because it's one of these things where we need to elevate the discussion. So the three of us can throw out these numbers every week on the podcast, and we do get reaction to it, but we need that level of groundswell conversation if you're going to make things happen, you need the 15 year olds to be engaged. I period. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's the way to do it. That, you know, how many of us growing up and how many of them have never gone to the cupboard and, and found it bare? Yeah. There's always been stuff, always been stuff in the cupboard. That's you can't really, people just don't really, you know, they think, well, I was very middle class. We were working poor. We were whatever, but the cupboard was never bare. No, nope. that's a whole different level that is very hard to relate to unless you live it. And what what I'm curious where all of this goes is actually politically, where we have now another group of what I would say <clears throat> very struggling young people in this country, and they are that age of you know twenty eight to thirty five range, for which you know if they had been voting liberal or NDP or whatever, I, I, there there's a good group of them now moving over to the Tories, not because they're ideologically bent, but because they're angry, they're upset, they're they're not listened to. Yeah, yeah. So we're older, we have a house, we have lines of credit that we maybe give to some kids or whatever. Like we're 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 on in life. There's a generation that Generation X who has not made it. They can't necessarily get a house because of the cost of living that's now gouging into those paychecks, many of them which may be having an hourly rate. Again, you know, it could be 30 bucks an hour, but you're now paying more for all those groceries and everything else. If you've got a house with kids and you even got it during the the pandemic, you're now paying a variable rate, which is hiking higher and higher and creating a pincer. So there's there's another issue here that's kind of under the surface. It's it's quite politically insidious. There's a a flavor that goes with everything that you just said, Dave, and that is that we have a generation now who is living on the edge all the time, and there's not necessarily anybody fighting for them. In the old days, it might have been the NDP who would have fought for, you know, the young worker and all, you know, that kind of class. But we have a group of people who uh, are just not represented, and I'll be interested to watch where they're going. There are a lot of them who are not necessarily ideological, you know, conservative federally, but there's a lot of them moving in that direction because at least they figure that through that anger, they might get some kind of action. So it's not just those in poverty who are in great need right now. If you move it up just one level and you even move it a little bit further than that, if you've got a house and you've got kids, that squeeze is very, very acute. And it's, I don't see it. I don't see it changing anytime soon. Like I, I don't. So it's, it's creating a real leverage on 
another group of people. There's a whole sense of being forgotten and that cuts across all political stripes. So I, I, I think you're right. That's the kind of the emotional brand that you're going to see uh, um, pop up here. Listen, we're, I want to get to the hydro story and I want to get to municipal elections, but let's not push it here. We can talk about that next week because I think they're both big stories and we need to take some time to uh, ruminate on them. So this is On the Ledge. I'm Dave Trafford, Keith Leslie from CHTV, and we've got John Wright from Maru Public Opinion on the Ledge for Story Studio Network. This is SSN. Story Studio Network.